Our next speaker is Kevin Ummel, and the title is The Making of a Foco Loco Bobo. Kevin and his wife Sarah decided to make Fort Collins the site of a lifelong experiment in living. They are both recovering bobos, and I have no idea what that means, so let's find out. So it's time for a quiz. Question number one. What percentage of Americans age 13 and older own an Apple iPhone? Question two. How much does the average American adult spend per week on wine? Now, I've asked over 100 friends and family this question, and their average response was 40% and $22. And I bet you that the average response in this room is pretty similar. But I'm sorry to say that you, like them, would be horribly wrong, because the correct answers are just 18% and $3. So what's going on here? Why does it seem that everyone I know lives on another planet? And that's actually not too far from the truth, because everyone I know, myself included, and most people in this room probably, are bobos, or bourgeois bohemians. So bobos are an educated and generally wealthy class of elites whose lifestyles attempt a very tenuous marriage between the materialism and self-interest of the 1980s and the social, cultural, and environmental liberalism of the 1960s. And you can recognize a bobo in the wild through its pattern of consumption. <laughs> So if you've ever listened to the soothing tones of Ira Glass and Terry Gross while casually shaving an organic sheep's milk manchego on a Japanese box grater, you're probably a bobo. Now don't get me wrong, I like bobos, I'm a bobo, okay? But the problem is that bobos live almost exclusively with other bobos. This is a map of Sur La Table locations. It's also a map of where bobos live. Now, when you live in a bubble, the problem is that your conception of what's normal becomes completely warped. Now, my wife and I are reluctant captives of the bobo bubble by education and profession, but that doesn't mean our material lives need to be like that of most bobos. So when we got married, we struck an extremely embarrassingly modest pact. We said our household consumption will not exceed that of the average American household of a similar size. And this wasn't just to be anti-bobo. We had good reasons. For example, environmental. So the number one predictor of your environmental footprint is your income. The more you make, the more you consume, the more you pollute. And spending a few extra dollars on a so-called green product, as bobos love to do, may reduce your footprint. But the dollars you don't spend definitely will. Another, in, uh, another reason was uh, financial. Bobos around us, their incomes would go up over time, and so would their consumption, often with no improvement in their quality of life. And I call this consumption ratcheting because it's much more psychologically difficult to reduce your consumption after you've committed to it than it is to just forego it in the first place. So we wanted to avoid that trap. Now we wanted to do this experiment in a way that was rigorous and verifiable. Good intentions were not good enough for us. We wanted to know if we were failing or succeeding and by how much. We needed data. So we began by tracking all of our personal expenses using a free website called mint.com. That's pretty easy to do. I also analyzed about 35 million data points from household surveys collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to find out how families across America spend their money. That is not so easy. So we broke all the consumption into 16 categories, three of which we decided to exclude. The big one was housing, and that's because prices vary a lot from place to place, and we didn't want someone in a high-rent district saying, well, none of this applies to me because of my housing costs. So we just threw out housing. But the other 13 categories are things that someone could reduce if they chose to. And we call these the capped categories and collectively capped spending. So we wanted to know, what would a typical family like ours spend on these capped categories? Now for us, the comparator household is a pre-retirement couple with no children living at home. And for that household type, we estimated that the capped spending in 2012 would have come in just under $35,000 per year. So how did we do? We did better on some categories than others. For example, we were 90th percentile on groceries. But overall, we are 20% below our consumption cap. And we propose that any bobo who comes in below their comparator has earned the label of low consumption bobo, or loco bobo. <laughs> now, we're doing well compared to the typical bobo, but we want to be more ambitious as we take this into the second year. So our new aspiration is based on a very old idea, and it's the idea of voluntary poverty. The typical household in poverty in this country has capped spending half of ours. Half. That is very low. Now, we think we might be able to get two-thirds of the way there without a significant reduction in our quality of life. But getting 100% of the way there will be a real long-term challenge. So enough about us. What about you? 
Here's typical cap spending for four different households. I want you to find the household that's closest to yours and burn that number into your brain because that is your consumption cap. That's what you need to go below to be a loco bobo. And it's tax season. This is the perfect time of year to make an estimate of what your household did in 2012. So go home, figure out how much you spent, throw out housing, throw out healthcare, throw out charity, figure out what's left, compare it to your target, and most importantly, just go loco. Thank you. Thank you. Now I know what it means.